Testing, testing. Happy Sabbath, church. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Can you hear me out there? Come on and bless the Lord, somebody, for the great things he has done. This is an amazing day. This is an amazing worship service. I got to tell you, with all the difficulty that you've had today for this baptism, you ought to anticipate God is trying to do something spectacular here. That tabernacle fell on the devil's radar. And everything and anything he could do to disrupt this service, he's attempted. But God is undefeated. Is there a witness in the house? God will not be, God will not be compromised. His plan will not fail. His children will be saved. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Is there anybody who can just lift up a, a, a voice of praise, a hand clap, a thank you? God is still on the throne. Is there five people in the house who would just praise the Lord? Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Somebody say right on, King Jesus. I bring you greetings from the Southeastern Conference. Our president, Dr. Michael Owusu, sends, sends his greetings this morning to let you know that you're, you are in his prayers and uh, he prays for the uh, plans that you have. Your, your first elder and your pastor have shared in abundance of all the great things that you are, you are doing and, are, and plan to do. And, uh, so, and we stand with you, we affirm you, and we hope that we could be of assistance to make those things happen. So God bless you and your great and amazing ministries here at the Tabernacle Church. And you have an amazing pastor. Did you know that? You have an amazing pastor. And I hope every now and again you let him know that he's a, he's a little bit amazing. Come on and say amen, somebody. So I just want to affirm the angel of this house, Pastor Garth Dotton, someone I've known for a very long time. And, and I'm, I'm thankful to, 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 to be a colleague with him. I'm thankful to work with him. And I'm most of all thankful to see how God is richly blessing this ministry through him. Come on and say amen. Amen. Without further ado, I just want to get into the word. Is that all right? Let's get into the word. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. And I'll be reading in your hearing verses 11 through 16. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was cleansed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Father in heaven, as we open your word, open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is at the end of his ministry. 
The Bible says that Jesus is journeying through Samaria and Galilee for the last time. After this, he will make, him, make his way through Jericho, then to Jerusalem, and then to the cross. Before Jesus is crucified, this is the last time they'll see him. The Bible says that he found it necessary to go through Samaria. Now, when you look at the geography of the region, to get back and forth from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, it wasn't necessary to go through Samaria. But Jesus had more than just a schedule to, compete, to, to complete. Jesus found it necessary because he was trying to create encounters with people who would have never, otherwise never seen him. Ministry of Healing, 431, Christ mingled among men as one who desired their good. And then he bade them follow me. Jesus went out of his way to make sure he crossed your path. And I don't know if it's too early in the service to praise God for the times when Jesus deviated from his course and ran across my designated path to interrupt my progress and remind me that I have a higher calling. Is there anybody who's glad that Jesus interrupted plans you had? He interrupted decisions you had. He interrupted uh, uh, things that you had put in place to do or to partake in. But then God showed up and changed your mind. Yeah. Bible says Jesus found it necessary to go through Samaria. And when he goes through Samaria, it says... There he found 10 lepers. Israel was plagued by a perversion of the law of Moses called a purity system. This purity system legalized discrimination using the Bible. It, it placed People in a caste according to holiness. So if you are a scribe or a Pharisee, you are among the most holy. But then beneath you were the rest of the Israelites and beneath them were the infirmed and then the Samaritans and then the Greeks. And so it's possible, it's possible for us to discriminate against one another and still lift up holy hands in church. It's possible to abuse one another and still give a right hand of fellowship. It's possible for us to hold grudges and not talk to each other sitting in the same building, one on this side and one on that side. The Bible says, according to the purity system, because they were leprous, they were kicked out of the city. There were no social programs to take care of their needs. They were, they were now court-enforced homeless. They had to fend for themselves. It was just them and the wild animals. The Bible says that they were out there in the woods and they could see in the distance a group of men walking and immediately they knew it was Jesus. Uh, I, I don't know if that caught your attention. These brothers don't go to church, but yet from a distance, 
they know what Jesus looks like. These brothers ain't been to Sabbath school, haven't been to seminary, don't understand your theology. However, they know Jesus. The text says no introduction is ever given. No one identified who, who they were. The one who initiates contact were the lepers. Did you know that proximity does not mean relationship? You could be in a group of people and still be alone. You could be a disciple and still not have a relationship. You could be in church and not saved. The Bible says that they're not, it's not that they're not even in church. They're not even in the city. And yet they have a relationship. They know Jesus, though they're not a part of the system. And maybe this might be a reminder to some of us who are feeling good about ourselves because we've been here for a while and we're active and we're involved and uh, we give and uh, we participate. That don't mean you know, G. There might be somebody who ain't never set foot in this building, but they got a prayer life that you can't compete with. Righteousness is not a group activity. Righteousness is a journey we set on individually. I've got to stand for Jesus on my own. Bible tells us, Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 3 um, that, that uh, the three Hebrews, according to our general understanding of the text, the three Hebrews, when they, when, when, when they were confronted by Nebuchadnezzar to, to, to bow to the image, we assume that they were standing together, arm linked together, and they decided together, we will not bow. That's, that's not biblical. That's not in the text. Remember, these, these were wise men for the king. They rep each represented a different province. They could not see each other at the time that the music played and the image was set up. So one was standing on his own and he doesn't know what the others are going to do. And the other is standing and he doesn't know what Shadrach is going to do. And Abednego was standing and he doesn't know what Meshach is going to do. But they had to make their decision on their own, believing that the others were standing on their own as well. And the text writes it together because they all were of the same mind. It's a lot harder when you think about it like that. God is not trying to save us as a group. He's trying to save us each individually because my struggle is different than your struggle. And he's going to need to strengthen me in some places that I'm weak that you may not be weak. And it's really not none of your business where I'm weak or where you're weak. I just pray for you that God finds you where you are so that you're safe. And I just hope you'll pray for me. Are you with me in here, somebody? The text says the ten lepers... Seek Jesus and immediately cry out, Master, have mercy on us. Have you ever prayed that prayer? The prayer doesn't have an introduction. It doesn't have a building, a building a movement. It doesn't have a climax or a conclusion. It's just a singular statement, Master, have mercy on us. 
the way the text is written, they didn't pray, they didn't pray this prayer once. They prayed it over and over and over again. If you live long enough, you'll learn that these nice, big, beautiful prayers in church are not the kind of prayers that you pray when, they, when, when, they're, when calamity happens in your life. You can't even put two words together. Sometimes the only thing you got is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, I prayed that prayer when my son's heartbeat dropped with every contraction and the doctor looked panicked. I don't have a prayer. I don't have a thou who liveth in palatial residences in heaven surrounded by the church. Don't nobody care about that right now. Jesus, I need you to do something right now. At some point, the cuteness expires, and we got to be real. Can we be real? Jesus, have mercy on us. I don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to do it, but I need you to do something. The Bible says, they cry out, and they cry out over and over and over again. Jesus stops. He looks upon them, and then he does something strange. He doesn't say, by your faith, you are healed. He doesn't say, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He doesn't create a mud pie and put it on their bodies and then say, go wash yourselves. No. The text says that Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, here's, here's, what's, here's, what's, here's the problem in the text. The problem is it's out of order. You see, you're not healed yet. So why would you go show yourself to the priest for the priest to tell you what you can already see is wrong with you? Are you with me? And, and so Jesus is actually operating out of order. He's asking you to do something that ain't going to work. Why would I show myself to the priest? God, you ain't done nothing yet. Have you ever prayed and nothing happened? I mean, not even a sign. The wind didn't blow. You, you, you know, because that's what I was looking for. I was looking for an, a, a breakthrough in the atmosphere. The Bible says, he says, go show yourself to the priest. The healing that they needed was not about how or what, but it was about who. If you keep wondering, see, I don't start believing something until I understand how it's going to happen or what is going to happen. Are you following me? Are you with me? But, but. See, that's called expectation. Expectation is built on evidence. The preponderance of the evidence draws a conclusion, and I stand on the conclusion. That's expectation. But hope is not built on evidence. Hope is built on faith. Faith is not about how he's going to do it or what he's going to do. It's about who's going to be doing it. And if I have faith in him, it don't matter the challenge that I face, he's got it handled. What's interesting in this story, Jesus says, go show yourself to the priests. But if you, if you understand the system, it was the priest 
that declared that they were unclean. It was the priest's declaration that caused them to be ejected from the city. It was the priest and this system that got them where they are. And what I love, this is my favorite part, what I love about this story, somebody pick that up, what I love about this story, go ahead and answer it and let them know you're in church. What I love about this story is that Jesus sends them back to the very people that kicked them out. The very people that said you don't belong here. The very people that said you were unclean. God will turn the table around and the foot will become the head and the head will become the foot. The latter will be greater than the former. God will set up a table before you and force your enemies to serve you. The very people that kick them out are the very ones that now have to open the door and let them back in. God is, God is so fully in control that we should, we should boldly come before him and challenge him to do things he ain't done before. Our prayers, I think, are too routine and elementary for an almighty God. I think, I think, I think we disrespect God by asking him to do routine stuff. I think we've, we've belittled his power because the major stuff, we set it aside and we ask him to do the basic. But, but, uh, but the text says, Remember not the things of old. Forget them. For today, I'll do a new thing. I need you to bring me some new challenges, some new victories, some new obstacles, some new prayers. You want to take things to a new level. The plans I have for you are greater than your imagination. text says that they were, they began to journey back to the priest. And uh, of course, you know, as they went, they were being healed. So with every step they took, the flesh on their bodies was transforming. As they got closer, they got better. As they got closer, they got stronger. And maybe, maybe this is encouragement for somebody who was expecting things to transform in an instant on the first day at the first moment, went to the gym one time and thought you was on a Schwarzenegger by the next morning. This is a process. It's going to take some time. Abs are not made in the gym. Abs are made in the kitchen. You've got to watch what you eat. Is there a witness in this house? God is saying there is a process to this thing. And if you stick with me, I'll take you places, places you've never been. You'll have a life you couldn't even dream dream of. God says my plans are bigger than your imagination. Just, just, just stick with the process. Stick with the plan as every step they took they got bigger. They got stronger. They got better. And then one of the lepers left the group and ran back to Jesus. They haven't made it halfway to the city yet. One of his, one of his swords disappeared. One sword disappeared. And he's ready to shout. He's ready to do a dance. He's ready to run up and down this aisle with one sword that has been healed. Some of y'all been blessed a long time. God has always made a way. You're perfect people. Ain't got nothing to go. But for some of us who've been in the struggle, 
who, who's been in some pain in the morning, who's had some bills due, who's had some family crises, who fell into a ditch and couldn't get out. When we see one sign that God is still with us, we are ready to give him some praise. He abides in the praises of his people. He's looking for a people that appreciate him. Because see, here's the thing. We out here looking for big blessings, big deliverance. What you didn't understand was waking you up this morning was a fight. You're, Getting you safely on I-95 was a battle. I was, watching a, I was watching an interview of a researcher, and they'd made a breakthrough in cancer research, and, and she was sharing, every day you live, with every meal you consume, you create eight cancer cells in your body. And I was like, whoa. She said that your body, and I kind of felt like she was trying to hide her Christianity. She was, she was being interviewed by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's, who's definitely an atheist. And she's trying to hide her, her, her disposition. And she said, you were so excellently designed. I said, I, I got you, I got you, I got you, I heard you. Don't worry, I ain't going to say nothing, but I heard you. You were so excellently designed that your immune system eradicates all the cancer cells by the end of the day. You have no idea what God had to go through to get you here today. You have no idea the dangers you were in, not just outside, but in your own body. He's fighting for you. Come on and praise somebody. He runs back to say thank you. And the text says, he starts saying thank you, but the way it's written, it's in the imperfect. Jesus said once, go and show yourself to the priest. The text says, his whole way back back to Jesus. He's crying out over and over and over again, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. It's like, the, it's like the record kept playing how hopeless he was. Remember, the purity system bars the Samaritan from ever getting any kind of love from a Jew and now he's a Samaritan with leprosy. So there's no way he's ever going to find deliverance. But, but on this day, he was hanging with some Jews and, and he met Jesus. And on this day, he found just a little bit of healing that he did not qualify for. Anybody glad for the blessings that you got that you weren't qualified for, that you should have never been eligible for, they should have never called your name, they should have never came down your road, they should have never sent it to your house, you should have never got the promotion, you should have never got the healing, but somehow the universe was shifted on its access and God poured a blessing in your account that should not be there. And when God does something like that, what kind of praise is he worthy of? Had the Miami Dolphins won the Super Bowl, how loud would our screams have been? Had the Heat won the finals, how much jumping and shouting would there have been? The text says that when they saw Jesus, they lifted their voices. Lifting their voice is not, is not a description of volume. 
It's a description of intensity. It shows that they did so passionately. And, 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 and can I just pause for a second? When we do come before God, it better be sincere, it better be real, and it better be passionate if we're going to get his attention. Are you with me in here, somebody? But then when, and later in the text, when the Samaritan comes by, the text says, he says, he says, thank you with a loud voice. His praise is not less than his petition. When we're in pain, when we're struggling, when we're in crisis, we pray with passion. But when God delivers somebody, when God breaks the yoke, when God releases the captive, why is it crickets in the house? Your praise must be greater than your petition. You ask God for healing. When he gives you the healing, you better give him some praise. And I understand it's cultural. So if Jamaica wins the World Cup, shh, don't say nothing. If Trinidad wins the World Cup, I'm, I'm not talking to somebody here. Don't say nothing. Because it's cultural, right? We don't praise because that's, that's just not in us. And so here God is saying, when is the last time, when is the last time the star player heard your prayers? When is the last time the star player fought your battle? When is the last time you needed healing and you could pick up the phone and call, call one of them? There's a book I want you to read. It's called Not a Fan. Not a Fan. Some of us are fans. Some of us are fans. We cheer for the home team when they're winning. But God forbid they have a losing season. We burn in the jersey in the front lawn and we put it in on Instagram. We're ashamed of the team. We take the tag off of our car and we throw the t-shirt in the trash. We're done with them. That's what fans do. Fans don't get into the ring. Fans don't get on the field or on the court. Fans don't have to sacrifice anything, but they're in the judgment seat to see if you've done a good job or not. Jesus is not interested in any fans. Jesus is looking for followers. That means if it works out, he's worthy of praise. If it don't work out, he's still worthy of my hallelujah. That's a follower. I'm a ride or die with Jesus. Like the three Hebrew boys, if, even if he does not save us, we will not bow. Are you with me here? That's who God is looking for. The text says, the text says that only one came back to say thank you. Now, here's what's interesting. Because the Bible is giving you, he's give, it's just giving you the facts. Bam, bam. This happened, this happened, this happened. And so you've got to use your sanctified imagination to fill in the blanks of what's at, what else is happening in the text. Are you with me? It's a group of us. We just, got, we just got our healing um, orders. And with every step, we're getting healed. And now, while we're getting healed, now, I'm the oddball. I'm the one that doesn't belong. Out of the ten, I'm the only Samaritan. Are you with me? And while they're walking, I'm sure 
The Samaritan said, yo, it's working. Are you getting healed? Did you feel what I just felt? Yo, let's go back and say thank you. Now, we good. Let's go to the priest. So y'all don't want to go? Let's go back and say thank you. What's wrong with y'all? It's not good enough? I guess this is where we part ways. And he runs back to say thank you. This is the most spectacular part of the text. When he goes back to say thank you, Jesus responds by giving him his full healing immediately. So while somebody else has to agonize to get their blessing, the one who has a relationship with Jesus ain't got to wait very long. My blessing is immediate as it comes out of his mouth. It is done. God wants you to live in the already not yet. He's calling you to live, not aspire, not talk about, not give lecture. He needs you to live in the already, what is the already not yet? He needs you to live like what you've asked has already happened even though you've, nothing has happened yet. Let me know that you believe that I have all power. Testify to the world that I'm undefeated. Live with the faith. Live with a Steph Curry anointing where you can shoot the shot, turn around and run to the back side of the court because you know as it left your head, it's going in. God is calling you to live in an already not yet experience. The worst mistake I've ever done was listen to the applause and the, and the compliments attaboys you're anointed worst thing worst mistake of my life was to listen to what other people had to say because whether it's a compliment or a criticism if you depend on it it's like building your house on sand And so now, listening to the compliments, I, I started to believe I have arrived. I made it. And then when I get back home, demons waiting at the door. So you think you have stuff. And reminded me daily you ain't made nothing. Am I talking to anybody here? And I had to divorce the image of myself that wasn't real and be and accept myself with all of my flaws. To the point where when people say it, I'm like, who are you talking about? So when God and I started to work on me, I started to feel the transformation before I heard anything from you. 
so that I could handle what you say and it doesn't affect me. Are you with me? I want you to imagine the Samaritan surrounded by Jews who have their own version of spirituality and the pressure to be like them. The pressure to live to their expectations. The pressure to fit in. If you don't fit in, congratulations. If you don't fit in, count it as a victory. You know why? Because God did not make you to fit in. Listen, listen to this, and I'm done. Whenever I try to be like English, when I try to be like PJ, um, I become a pathetic version of PJ. Because can't nobody beat PJ at being PJ because there's only one PJ. Are you with me? And as bad as I work at it and copy and emulate, there's nothing I can do that will ever measure up. But when I, when I accept me and then allow God to work on me, I become the best me that the world has ever seen. And what God can do through me in this world is greater than I could ever imagine. Jesus looks at him, he says, why was there only one? Where are the nine? And the one who came back is a Samaritan. The, uh, all this time I thought, all this time I thought that, that Jesus, Jesus healed the Samaritan because he was associated with the nine. And so I even preached this text by association. And so because I was with the people of God, I got the blessings of God. And because I got the blessings of God, I came back to give God thanks. Are you with me? But when you read the Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, no, it's the other way around. The one didn't get the healing because of the nine. The nine got their healing because of the one. And the one was a Samaritan. It was the one that didn't fit in. It was the one that was rejected. It was the one that was at the bottom of society. It was the one who had never been to your church, but has a relationship with Jesus. And because of his relationship, he got healed. And because he got healed, everybody got healed. God is trying to bless everything connected to you. The nine are not the cause. The nine are the recipients. So today, who's, who feels like the nine or the one? You've been waiting. You've been agonizing. You've been struggling. But I just want to let you know that Jesus is going to take a detour on his path. He's headed to the cross, but before he gets to the cross, he's going to come off the low, the, he's going to get on the road less traveled, and he's going to cross in front of your way to give you an opportunity to get what you need, to get your healing to get your deliverance, to get your breakthrough. 
to be saved. Today is a day of baptism. It's a day of deliverance. So here's a question. Who wants to be delivered? Who wants to be baptized? Who wants the chains to break? Who's looking for the spiritual and the physical healing? Who's waiting for the breakthrough? Who wants to give their life to Jesus? To break away from the crowd and stand on your own before the Almighty. Who's that person? Are you here? Are you here? Just, just wave your hand if you're here. The doors of this church are open. This is a good pastor. This is a good church community. These people are in love with Jesus. And, and I think I can speak on behalf of Pastor Dotton and this church by saying, this is good ground. This is a good place to come and grow in Christ. This is a good place to reach the community. This is a good place to raise your family. And if you are looking for a church, this should be your number one candidate. And if you're looking for a church this morning, this afternoon, why don't you stand? Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we thank you. We thank you that you took a detour. You changed the course of your way to make sure that we got one more opportunity to see you, to hear you, to experience you. One more time, he's allowed us to come together. So God, today as we pray, every person under the sound of my voice, I'm praying that the person that needs to make a decision to choose you, God, you disrupt their routine now in the name of Jesus. God, change plans today. Cancel the devil's plans today. Break yokes, break chains today in the name of Jesus. Don't let anyone leave here without you. Without the Holy Spirit. Without the indwelling power of salvation. That's every family represented here. God gives somebody the strength not to fight God, but to choose you. 
Because it's not our job to save ourselves. That's your job. If we choose you, God, you'll fight our battles. You'll break the habits. You'll release us from the addictions. You'll lift us out of the depression. You'll break us free of the abusive relationship. God, you can win for us. So today, help us to choose you. Help us, God. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And we'll be careful to give you the praise the honor and the glory in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen.